Good morning. Good morning and welcome to our fourth annual Balboa Park Sustainability Partners Breakfast. Thank you all for being here with us today and being such a supportive partner of the Balboa Park Cultural Partnership and our sustainability efforts. For those of you who don't know me, and I think I know most of the people in the room, but in case if you don't, my name is Jessica Travis, and I look after the sustainability program with a great team within Balboa Park Cultural Partnership. So if you haven't met them yet, Ruby and Kelsey are also a part of our team, so make sure you introduce yourselves to them. Um, before we go ahead and get started, I want to recognize and acknowledge a few individuals that we have with us today. First of all, Bubble Park team members. That includes BPCP board members, facility directors, green team, and other individuals. And also the city of San Diego, we have representatives from economic development, facilities division, environmental services, and park and rec. So thank you for being here, because really it's a partnership um, of all of us together. We also have some elected representatives, so thank you to Deanna Spain for being here from California Senator Tony Atkins' office, and Steve Hill from California Assembly Member Todd Gloria's office. Appreciate you. And then we also have our esteemed speakers who we'll hear from um, shortly. So what have we been up to since we last met um, a year ago in this room? We've actually put a lot of thought into planning and what our future looks like. And so we completed a strategic plan and we also took a look at how we can better communicate with our member organizations and our stakeholders so that we can increase Balboa Park's profile as a sustainable destination across the nation. We recently worked with the um, EPIC at the University of San Diego to complete a greenhouse gas inventory, and we found that most of our greenhouse gas emissions, or 42%, comes from the electricity within the buildings that we operate, and then a close second is the commuting of our volunteers and of our employees at 38% of our emissions. And then third is our natural gas at about 18% of our total emissions. And then in follow-up to looking at our energy and greenhouse gas emissions, EPIC also provided us with potential scenarios to reduce those greenhouse gas emissions in 17 of our buildings. And we're going to use this information to guide the future initiatives of our program. And so I look forward to um, continued partnerships, and I hope you all watch our program as we um, forge this new path. Now, getting back to the program for today, this morning we're going to hear from two of our program founders, the City of San Diego and San Diego Gas and Electric, and then we're going to go into our fourth annual Balboa Park Sustainability Awards that you see next to me, which recognize the achievements of our member organizations. And then we're going to start into our education portion of the morning, and we're going to dive into making the commitment, which is this year's theme. With the, with the past themes, we were very specific with implementation and really digging into the benefits of sustainability and doing projects. And now in our fourth year, we're going to be broadening our impact so there's a little bit more for everyone in the room. For those number-oriented folks, for the community outreach people that work a lot in the communities, to the change makers at every level of the organizations. And I have a feeling that a lot of the change makers are in this room right now. The panel is going to dive into, when done right, how a commitment to sustainability and other types of social responsibility can really help drive an organization's mission and can increase their bottom line, often transforming the organization in ways that you haven't even imagined yet. And so without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker for today, our BPCP board president and president and CEO of the Fleet Science Center, Dr. Steven Snyder. All right, thank you, Jessica, and let's all thank Jessica for the amazing work that she has been doing. It really is uh, incredible what she has done. So uh, welcome, it's great to see you all here this morning. You know, with over 1,200 acres and countless culture, science, arts, and recreational opportunities, uh, Balboa Park is, as we say, ever-changing but always amazing. And it's great to see you all here this morning uh, to talk about sustainability. You know, it's been probably going on 15 years ago that the Balboa Park Cultural Partnership was formed initially by 13 different organizations that all got together to talk about well, what are those issues of mutual interest and concern to us. Uh, and now here we are, a uh, number of years later, with uh, quite a much, big, much larger 
separate organizations. So in addition to the 30 organizations that are our members, we have the um, uh, Parkwide Pass, which offers free year-round admission uh, to 16 museums. We have the Community Access Pass and the new Military Appreciation Pass, which reach 7,500 fa uh, families across the county. We have the, uh, we have continual com uh, um, collaborative marketing and park-wide events, our One Park, One Team initiative, which allows for networking with our, 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 our staff, uh, for networking collaboration opportunities, the Balboa Park Learning Institute, which provides professional opportunities not just for those in the park, but across the county and even internationally, and of course the sustainability initiative, which is why we're here today. Uh, we're celebrating this year 10 years of that initiative and initially formed as a collaboration between the partnership, the City of San Diego and San Diego Gas and Electric. Uh, and when we started, boy, there was a lot to learn. From baseline data to figuring out new technologies to even understanding the terminology of the day. Is it global warming? Is it climate change? Is it sustainability? Is it but, 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 but all the kind of things, so those kind of little things, to really the hard work to figure out what we were going to do. But thanks to partners like uh, the city and San Diego Gas and Electric, we've really come an enormous way. And the impact that this program has made has is, is really been substantial. From reducing our <clears throat> energy use, cutting back on our water use, uh, our waste production, the greening of our buildings, uh, these things have had, all of these efforts have had an enormous uh, impact not just on our uh, operations but also on our community our impact on the environment and they all save money which is money and resources that get put back into further arts culture and science opportunities and experiences for our entire region so it really is a a wonderful program and uh, has had an incredible incredible impact now um, if you don't mind I'm going to share a story with you and what are you going to do I have the mic so um, Years ago, when the compact fluorescence actually first kind of finally got hold, right, somewhere in the, the late, late 90s, early 2000s, when they started showing up uh, on the market, uh, even though they were invented back in the 70s, this was a big change for science museums. And not just because of changing light bulbs, but because you've probably all been to a science center where they have that device where you sit down on a bicycle and you pedal, and it's attached to a generator, and the faster you pedal, the more electricity you do, and it lights up one light, two light, three lights, four lights, five lights, right? So this is what, for years, we've had these great devices, and everyone loved them. Kids would go and pedal and pedal until they're sweating, and the fathers would get on and try to beat them. A really good experience about how uh, to change energy into light, uh, how the light bulbs work. But then these CFLs came on the market, and boy, we had a new change, because now we could have a light bulb and a switch between an incandescent light bulb and a CFL light bulb, and you could see how much more energy it took to light one than the other. But of course, as science centers, when we do, an ex uh, do a new change to an exhibit like that, we can't just let it go. And so what we do is we send people out on the floor with clipboards that hide in the back and lurk in the back and watch what you're doing. It's not creepy, it's science. <laughs> and we want to see, we're looking for behaviors. Do you use it right? Do you learn something? Does it matter? Or have we just, you know, created a whole new interactive for no particular reason? And so when we had this out on the floor, uh, I was walking around and, and just standing watching with someone who was doing the study, watching what was going on. Uh, and this family came up, it was a father with three daughters, all probably under the age of 12. And one at a time, they get on and they ride the bicycle and they turn from uh, the, the regular light bulb to the CFL light bulb and the next gets on and does it. And the youngest gets on and she can barely reach the pedals. And so the older, oldest sister is helping her. Meanwhile, the father is next to uh, the, the middle daughter and is reading the text panel to her. You know, it's not mansplaining, it's dadsplaining. And we've all been dadsplained too, right? Well, this is what it looks like. So we're watching, it goes on, and think, good, okay, so the father's working with the child, the kind of behavior you want to see. And the daughter is there, oh, rolling her eyes. Oh, that's not what you want to see. It's never good when people are rolling your eyes in your museum. It's not what you want to see. But she's rolling her eyes. The father gets done explaining to it, explaining what the CFLs and the use of energy says, well, maybe you should go and change the light bulbs in your room. And she goes, Tad. It doesn't matter if I change my light bulb. It only makes a difference if we change ours. I'm like, there you go, right? There's, not only does she get the message, but she gets bonus points for, uh, for the fact that her dad tried to educate her and she and he got schooled. <laughs> Fantastic kind of thing to, to see. But particularly, the story is particularly uh, important to this here because it is about 
not us changing something, it's how we change. And so it's great, It'd be, you know, it's perfectly good for the fleet or the Museum of Man or, or the Timken to make a change to their uh, processes and make improvements to the efficiencies of theirs. But really makes a difference is when it's not one building, it's 10 LEED certified buildings. It's not one place with solar panels, it's, a sol it's, a, it's looking at renewable energy to, fund the, uh, to fuel the park. It's looking at these large scale collaborative initiatives, how we all work together to make a change. It's not about my museum, it's about our park. And it's about the work all of you have done to make this change. And so for that, I thank you all and congratulate you for the really enormous, incredible work that you've done to make a really big difference, not just for our park, but for San Diego. And we've been sharing, Jessica's been out sharing the story uh, to the people in the region, to people around the world as well. We've gotten national attention for the work we've done here, and we've managed to reach in, the, in our uh, organizations thousands of people with this message of how the park individually, how the museums can make a change, and collectively the park can make a big difference in the world. And you all are a big part of that, so thank you very much. Uh, I also want to particularly thank uh, San Diego Gas and Electric for their partnership over the years. And now I have the great honor to introduce Scott Cryer. He's the Vice President of Customer Services at San Diego Gas and Electric. He is a passionate about the future of our energy in our region and currently serves on the board, uh, board of Directors of Clean Tech San Diego. So please help me welcome Scott Cryer. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Snyder. I, you know, I can, there, there are a few times when I can actually be a cool dad. So to, I think to follow on to your story, you know, trying to explain to an eight and 10 year old uh, about what I do on a day-to-day -day basis working at a utility, I usually get absolute looks of boredom. But when I can actually explain what we're doing here in terms of the partnership and the event this morning, really the proverbial light bulb goes off uh, in their head and they can see firsthand uh, why partnerships like this and why Balboa Park and why sustainability uh, is so important. So uh, thank you for allowing me to actually uh, look cool in front of my kids for a change coming here this morning. So, um, you know, at San Diego Gas and Electric, you know, we're, our mission is to become the cleanest, safest, and most reliable energy company in America. Now, utilities are always focused on safety and reliability. Those are foundational for us. But at SDG&E, we've added clean and sustainability uh, to our, really to our core mission. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're really proud that sitting here today in our region, that 43% of our power comes from renewable resources. That is more than any utility in the state and probably more than any utility in the country. Okay, so we're really proud of the work that we've been able to achieve to increase the amount of renewables uh, in, this, in this region. But you know, you know, as we think about sustainability, renewables is just one part of the equation. Energy efficiency continues to be the cheapest way that we can uh, deploy uh, resources in order to get uh, reductions in energy demand and greenhouse gas emissions. And I'm real proud to say with the partnership, um, we've helped the, the, the park save 9 million kilowatt hours of electricity and over $1.6 million a year, and that's dollars that can go back into programs to, to, to help make this uh, cultural gym uh, be sustained for the long term. You know, we've also been very supportive of the green building transformations here in Balboa Park. And through the collaboration with the Balboa Park Cultural Partnership, uh, San Diego Green Building Council, City of San Diego, we now have 10 LEED certified buildings right here in Balboa Park. So I think you guys deserve an applause for that. And then really finally, I'm, I'm really proud that my staff has the opportunity to work uh, you know, with, with Balboa Park to really plan for the next chapter of, of their green energy future. And, you know, under the leadership of the Balboa Park Conservancy, the Hos House of Hospitality, which we're sitting in now, is the first facility in Balboa Park to sign up for our eco-choice program. That means that, the, that, means that the, this facility is now being powered by 100% renewable energy. So this is fantastic. You know, this is a program that we launched uh, earlier or late last year where businesses and residential customers can sign up to get 100% of their energy from renewables. We have about 800 uh, customers today and we continue to see that grow because there is really a demand for clean energy in this region. So um, with that, I uh, just wanted to thank everybody for um, uh, allowing us to be a partner uh, with you. This is something, one of, our, one of our most favorite partnerships in the region. And a, very, and, and a big congratulations for all the success, and uh, we look forward to continuing that partnership in the future. Thank you very much.
that is the biggest faux pas. As somebody who used to work on the city council, it is my deep pleasure to, <laughs> to, to introduce council member Chris Ward to the stage. Thank you. Not a problem. Hello, friends. It is really a pleasure to be back with you, uh, with the partners here this morning. You know, it was about a year ago when I was walking into the park uh, that I realized it was about a year ago that I had the pleasure of joining this breakfast, and my predecessor, Todd Gloria, was receiving an award, a gorgeous award, for his commitment to um, sustainability in the park. And so, wow, what a difference a year makes in my ability to be a servant for the park. It's really a pleasure to be here. It's not only uh, just a joy to be able to represent and serve Balboa Park, but it's really a joy to be able to remark on the continued strides that the park is able to make. That's what we're really here to celebrate. You know, when we launched the Balboa Park Sustainability Program 10 years ago, it was just a sign of how committed this community was to making sure that environmental issues were a part of the park's future. And it shows what a leader our park leaders have been uh, to be able to stay committed to sustainability measures. And we've seen that progress that both Steve and Scott mentioned, helping to transform over the last 10 years so many buildings to become lead green certified buildings at a wide range, but these are 1915 exhibition buildings. And so if we can do that and save millions of hours of electricity for our treasured arts and cultures uh, organizations, just imagine what the other opportunities are for the park. They are boundless. So I know that we have a lot of people here that are committed to those sustainability measures and you certainly have a partner in myself and my colleagues there to back you up every step of the way from City Council. As many of you know, I serve on the Environment Committee on our City Council and I'm looking forward to so many kind of new ideas that we can implement this year. We're looking at cool pavements for making our streets a little bit cooler, reducing heat island effects. We want to implement plans that we have already in place, like our zero waste plan, recreation measures, tree canopies, bicycle master plans, and of course, our very um, groundbreaking and transformative climate action plan. We have to meet those goals, and those goals are measurable, and we can do this. The recent greenhouse gas survey that the Balboa Park uh, leaders were able to complete is important because it helps us identify ways to actually specifically decrease our carbon footprint and reduce waste, therefore saving resources and meeting those climate action plan goals. For example, a transportation survey found that 75% of park employees and volunteers drive alone to work, which is similar to commuting behaviors that we find throughout San Diego County. So for, in order for us to meet that climate action plan goal, we need to be able to provide additional mobility options for the park. And we have protected bike lanes that are about to break ground in Bankers Hill on 4th and 5th Avenue, but we need to stay committed to access points through Park Boulevard and other regional transportation networks. And so not just within the city, but our park partners at MTS, NCTD, and of course Sandag, we want to make sure that we are advancing a shared mix of transportation options to help meet those climate action plan goals. I am truly excited and really hopeful for where we are going as a San Diego community and specifically where we are going with the park. But I know we can't do that without the focused effort of BCPC on sustainability measures. And I'm really just here to welcome you all, thank you all, and also congratulate and uh, recognize all the awardees we have. They are certainly well-deserved awards that we're about to give out this morning and it is sincerely appreciated by all of us and the San Diego community. Thank you. Councilmember Award and all of our speakers. So I think some of the priorities that you just mentioned, you're going to hear about them in our award finalists. So hopefully they align well. Um, so now we're going to transition to our um, fourth annual sustainability awards. And to announce this year's finalists, I would like to introduce last year's winner, the Japanese Friendship Garden, represented by Marisa Espinoza, mm -hmm. the operations assistant. And so um, in tradition with um, this year's award of having Babo Park artists make the awards, you'll see they're beautiful. I wanted to um, read descriptions to you about um, the artists who created these awards. Artist Shirley Ju is an active member of the Potter's Guild. She is inspired by the earth's clay as a malleable medium that can take an endless number of forms. Finished with natural glazes, her elegant circular vases stand as testaments to the union and beauty of functionality. 
Balboa Park Green Team member Anthony Kiefer contributed his woodworking skills to create the award bases out of recycled wood. Good morning. So we have five honorees. The first is the Balboa Park Conservancy for Tree Balboa Park. The Balboa Park Conservancy is working with the city's Park and Recreation Department to update Balboa Park's tree inventory and plant 500 trees within Balboa Park over the next two years, helping restore the park's badly depleted tree canopy and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. The Fleet Science Center for Sustainable Festival the One Day Sustainable Festival at the Fleet Science Center brought collaborators from throughout the county to demonstrate elements of sustain sustainability. The festival highlighted three pillars of sustainability, healthy people, healthy communities, and healthy environments. San Diego Museum of Man for their exhibition, Living with Animals. Living with Animals helps to solve a regional sustainability challenge by reducing the carbon footprint of an exhibition. This included looking at sustainability from every level, including reducing waste, using low VOC paints, increasing the use of natural light, to name a few. The San Diego Natural History Museum for passive climate control. The NAT implemented simple, easy to maintain passive techniques to help control temperature, humidity, and light levels in a historic building. Insulated aluminum framed fiberglass panel window inserts helped control fluctuations in exhibits, and rechargeable desiccant cassettes control humidity levels in exhibit cases. And finally, San Diego Zoo Global for zero waste initiatives. San Diego Zoo Global held a zero waste event for all attendees of the Association of Zoos and Aquariums 2016 conference in 2016, and reached 90% diversion uh, at the zoo in 2016. By the end of 2017, San Diego Zoo Global will have diverted more than 50 tons of food waste from landfills. Thank you. So I'd like to um, invite Scott back up to present the awards to our um, winners. And so our first award winner, I'll give this to you because you can present it. Yay. So it's the San Diego Zoo Global for their zero waste efforts. And then you can even put like a flower in there for water. They're air plants, they're mobile. That's great, thank you very much. Thank you. And they're a photographer over here. We'll shake hands out. Thank you. Congratulations, Adam, and the whole San Diego team. Our next award winner is the San Diego Natural History Museum. <laughs> for their passive use of energy efficiency. and certainly not least, the Babal Park Conservancy. Do you have a shovel to plant those trees? Yes. <laughs> I was hoping for the green one. <laughs> So congratulations to all three of this year's award winners and to all of our finalists. Every year this award gets a little bit more competitive, which I kind of like. So congratulations to all of you.
Now we're going to move on to the education portion with our keynote and panel. So I would like to welcome to the stage Julianne Markow. Most of you may know her from her time at the San Diego Museum of Art or at the New Children's Museum. And over the past year, Julianne has been consulting with organizations on corporate social responsibility. And she currently serves as the Chief Operating Officer at The Voice of San Diego. And so whenever we were thinking about this year's theme of making the commitment, Julianne instantly came to mind with all of her posts and everything that she does on LinkedIn, the connections she has, and her dedication to making organizations more sustainable and more responsible. So Julianne, um, please share some of your experiences with us. Good morning, and uh, thank you, Jessica, and to the Balboa Park Cultural Partnership. I see lots of familiar faces and friends from my years of working in the park. So thank you for inviting me to speak to you today, and I'm honored, delighted to be here as part of the conversation about making a commitment to sustainability. Um, I do want to add my congratulations to the winners of today's awards. Those were really beautiful. So let me sh start by sharing my definition of sustainability. Many people and organizations think about it as environmental practices um, with a specific focus on resource conservation. And that is the primary focus of this morning's conversation. However, I prefer to look at sustainability, as Jessica men mentioned, through a broader lens and to consider what it means for the whole organization. The dictionary defines sustainability as the ability to be maintained at a rate or level. So think about that for a minute. So if we apply that concept to an organization as a whole, it helps us to think about what policies and practices an organization should undertake to ensure its viability or sustainability into the future. How will an organization behave so that it is sustainable, has longevity, and will continue to be a vital contributing member of its community. When I have these conversations in the past with clients, of course we've talked about environmental practices, but we also examine their human resources policies and their engagement within the community where they're based, in this case in San Diego. Simply put, we evaluate the practices with regard to people, planet, and community. So why think about sustainability in this particular way? And why should organizations care about these subjects? Well, first of all, because your stakeholders care. Your clients care, your customers care, your employees care, all of you, um, and your investors and donors care. This is a subject that's becoming increasingly important across organizations. So let me just share a few quick statistics with you. Recent research shows that 81% I repeat that 81% of consumers believe that businesses should donate, advocate, or even change their operations to align with social and environmental needs. On an employee front, we know that 51% of employees are currently seeking a new position. I'm sure no one out here is doing that. But we also know that 85% of employees say that they are likely to stay longer with an organization that shows a high level of social responsibility. So if you're trying to keep that 51% of people within your organization, these kinds of practices are a great tool. Lastly, just looking on a global basis, investment in environmentally and socially responsible companies has grown exponentially in the last 20 years and now is close to $7 billion in the US alone. So all this indicates that there are good, solid business reasons to tackle sustainability. Indeed, we see that increasingly companies around the globe are realizing that we don't live in a world of limitless resources, and their stakeholders expect them to play a leadership role in addressing the challenges that we face as a planet. As Jessica mentioned, during the past year, I spoke with many companies throughout the San Diego area. Most of them are doing something in at least one or two areas of people, planet, and community. Many others are thinking about the issue, but maybe haven't quite taken any action yet. And there are only a few who are really taking a strategic approach to sustainability, like SDG&E, and thinking about how it can help their organizations grow. 
So don't get me wrong, doing something is better than doing nothing, but I'd argue, and this is what I discussed with my clients, that making a strategic commitment to sustainability is really better. It will drive better results in all three areas of people, planet, and community, and it will help your organization become sustainable. That is, maintain yourself as a going concern, and certainly that's what I'm always looking forward to. So, presumably all of you are here today because you have an interest in sustainability, either personally, professionally, or hopefully both. So I'm curious. Raise your hands. How many of you work at an organization that has a sustainability plan in place already? So a fair number of people, great. And how many of you work at a place that's thinking about it, looking into the initiative, maybe has a committee? A few, okay. And how many of you feel like the lone voice in the wilderness on this subject? No, a few shy hands going up, okay. Well, so for those of you in the first group, congratulations. I feel like I'm speaking to the converted. Um, I know that there's a panel of speakers coming up after this, and they will certainly have more advice and insights about how to maximize the benefits of a plan and keep it robust. For others in the room, I just have a few tips that I wanna share that I have found very helpful when having these conversations and helping clients find their way. So the first and most important is to align with organizational goals. We all know that resources, time and money, particularly in the not-for-profit sector, are, are uh, scarce. So if you can find a way to connect your sustainability efforts with existing initiatives, you can help your organization achieve its goals. The second is listen carefully to your colleagues. Figure out how you can help people in other parts of the organization solve their challenges, achieve their goals, using sustainability practices. Similarly, seek allies from other parts of your organization. I know some of the organizations here today are quite small, but it's always good to have a team working on a project. Once you have that team, demonstrate wins. Show people how this is helping them. Really important, find a sponsor who's a senior member of the organization. That way you have a champion at the top. It could also be a member of your board. Remember this, because I know we all try to think, we wanna get it all done. Start small, set some achievable goals, and have clearly identifiable wins. Once you achieve those wins, celebrate the success. I'm notorious for like, okay, we did that check, let's keep going, um, but it's good to take a breath and say, yay, good for us, just like we're doing this morning. Last and maybe most important, be authentic. Don't try to undertake efforts that don't align with your organization and aren't natural to your organization. So I wanna just give you a real life example of how these principles can produce results. About this time last year, I began to work with a local business. Some of you I'm sure are familiar with them, Evans Hotels, which operates the Bahia, the Catamaran, and the Lodge at Torrey Pines, all beautiful properties. The CEO, Robert Gleason, knew that the hotels were active in his community and they were doing good stuff, but he didn't really truly understand what they were doing. So we looked at all the areas of sustainability as I defined them at the start of the talk, environmental, employee benefits, community engagement. There was lots of stuff happening and there were a handful of employees driving each effort, but no one had an overall picture of how the pieces fit together. After several months of really digging through materials, interviewing members of the leadership team, we compiled a comprehensive picture of the activities and the policies that they had in place. They were all over the map. At the time, I told Robert, they got an A for effort and a C minus for execution. So he wasn't exactly happy with that, but he understood what I was saying. So realizing that the organization was missing opportunities with all of its stakeholders, having a haphazard approach to sustainability, Robert, the CEO, decided it was time to create a plan for the hotel sustainability and corporate social responsibility practices. We started with a manageable project, remember start small, and brought some clarity to what was being done already. We developed metrics that captured what they are doing created a beautiful scorecard, which I think is up on their website if you wanna look at it, 
so they have a scorecard now to report on their metrics, and articulated why each of those metrics was chosen and how it relates to the company's broader goals. So again, tying back to the organization as a whole. We prepared a presentation for the company's board of directors, and I think even Robert was a little surprised at how enthusiastically they embraced all of the recommendations. In fact, at the end of the meeting, they even told him that they wanted to take it further. So I think that's a pretty big win, don't you think? This outcome reinforced for me the importance of not just doing, but taking time to step back, look at your organization's goals and objectives on a global basis, and then make a commitment to sustainability practices that support these goals. Actively articulating your commitment, putting a stake in the ground, not only holds you accountable, but it also can inspire others to action. I just wanna wrap up by challenging all of you to think about how you might start or build some momentum for a sustainability initiative at your organization. Remember, start small, align with bigger organizational goals, and find allies. Good luck, I look forward to being here next year and seeing who won the awards for 2018. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. So my name is Dennis Larson. I'm with Nexus Planning and Research. Um, this is actually my fourth year facilitating this panel and working with Jessica. Um, one of the questions I want to ask is, how many people, is this, is this your first time being at the breakfast? Can you raise your hands? Wow, that's a really good number. Um, what about your sec second time? Wow, third time? Fourth time? Woohoo! Okay, so we've been doing, like I said, we've been doing it for four years, and each time we're facilitating the panel, we want to do something a little bit different. So this time around, um, instead of just having the panelists come up and we just talk to them right now, we're going to incorporate an exercise. So what I want you to do is, and there's like a wooden box in front of you that has a card. If you can reach in and grab that, then there's also a glass jar that has pens inside of it. So when we're following up with this commitment to sustainability, we recognize that that commitment happens at two levels, one at the individual level and then one at the organizational level. So this is a two-part exercise because we want to make it as complicated as possible. So first we start with the organizational element. And the thing is, and as we recognize when Julianne, when she had you, when she asked how many people had a sustainability plan, about maybe half of you raised your hands. And we recognize that to make that commitment, we have to kind of meet you in the middle. And we also have to meet you at that individual level and at that organizational level. We also recognize that some organizations are deeply entrenched in sustainability and other ones are just starting out. But within those organizations, and that's probably most everybody who's here because you're here today, you do believe in sustainability. And so there's the question of if your organization is really not, or I should say this, they don't have a sustainability plan, but you're committed to it and you believe in it, what, how can you really contribute to that? So the goal of the overall exercise today is for you to be able to leave and say, this is how I can set my own personal goal about making a commitment to sustainability in the organization and just push it a little bit forward. It's a little bit like what Julianne's saying, like it's make each day just a little bit better, make one little incremental step forward, all right? So if you take this card, and you'll see in the very front of it, there's gonna be a word cloud on the bottom. And what I want you to do is really just think about your organization um, and their commitment to sustainability. So really just circle the words in here that describe your organization's relationship with environmental sustainability. At the same time, I'd like the panelists to come up, please. So uh, we have Jason Anderson with Cleantech. Uh, we have Jonathan Hamm with, with Parallax. And by the way, I'm not gonna read their bios, just in the interest of time. The bios are in uh, the handouts that you received. And then Morgan Justice Black with San Diego, oh, she's right behind me, with San Diego Gas and Electric. And I don't know if anyone remembers, but we used to have the chairs, just the chairs that you're sitting in, not that they're bad chairs. But it was always a little bit strange that we had these small chairs that people would sit in. So now I want to thank Jessica and everyone for making like this TED Talk style where we have these really comfortable chairs. So I'm going to move over, and what I'm going to tell you right now is I was told not to talk into the mic because it's going to do that screaming sound. So if it does, I'm just going to apologize from the start. I feel like we need like a glass of wine or something. Um, 
So just to follow up on where Julianne's at, I'm going to start with Jason first. Um, we're talking about the commitment to sustainability, and we want to look at it from like a regional level, kind of an organization-wide level, kind of at a community level. So Jason, you, you manage like your overall organization's like critical mission, um, and you lead like Smart City San Diego. Um, Julian talked about the importance of sustainability to employees and stakeholders, uh, which clearly has an economic component. And I was wondering, could you address like the San Diego regional economic impact? Sure. So again, thank you for having uh, Clean Tech San Diego here today, Jessica. Thank you for your work on this. I'm not sure that I knew that we shared the same birthday. Uh, Clean Tech San Diego was actually launched 10 years ago to really help the San Diego region advance the development and deployment of clean technology and renewable energies here in our greater San Diego region. Um, today, we're number four in the country in terms of our leadership around clean technology and renewable energy leadership. Um, and a lot of that's because, um, actually all of that's because what's happening here in our region and obviously what's happening in the state of California. Uh, so a lot of great things happening here. Before I answer your question, I'm just going to talk really quickly about some of the great things that are happening here in San Diego, if that's okay. Um, so first and foremost, as no surprise, we're number one in the country as it relates to solar installations. Uh, meaning we have more rooftop solar installations than any other city in the country. Uh, we have about 25,000 electric vehicles on the ground here in San Diego, which is, I think is the most per capita of any city. Sorry, Morgan, if I'm stealing some of your thunder over there. Um, we also are home to the world's largest lithium-ion battery storage facility. Uh, we have significant amount of both residential and commercial storage facilities. Um, so a lot of great things that are happening here in our region. Um, and what we've really tried to strive for in, at Clean Tech San Diego and kind of this greater region is that the environmental benefits of sustainability also have economical benefits as well, and those two don't have to necessarily be at odds. Um, and we've obviously proven that here in San Diego, um, and we've obviously proven that here in California. So from an economic perspective, um, Clean Tech San Diego represents about 117 companies, nonprofits, the military, uh, cities, the port, airport, number of different organizations um, that are not only developing clean or renewable technologies, but also um, deploying those technologies. Um, and while most of them want to do this for the environment, or for environmental reasons, uh, they also see significant economic reasons behind it as well. So energy efficiency and some of the things that Scott and Steve both talked about earlier. Um, from an economic perspective, we like to think about this industry as a significant contributor to our regional economy. Um, today, we employ about 36,000 people um, in the San Diego region in the clean tech and renewable energy space. Um, I like to say, especially now, uh, that's more than the entire country employs in the coal industry. Um, so we have a pretty strong and significant renewable energy industry here in San Diego. We've got about 2,000 plus uh, companies that are doing business in the space, meaning they're developing technologies or providing solutions or services uh, to reduce energy or water, or increase electric transportation, whatever it may be. Um, and that means it's about a $6.8 billion economic output to our region. So it's no small thing. Uh, San Diego, as you know, is obviously a leader in the life science industry. We've got a large concentration of military here. Um, our communications and wireless industry is strong. Um, and from the clean tech and renewable standpoint, uh, it's, it's significant as well. So, again, we see a lot of stuff what's happening in the environmental space here in the region, um, but for us, there's also a significant amount of economic opportunity as well. And when you look at the passage of climate action plans by cities around the region, including the city of San Diego, you know, they're really looking at this from an economic perspective and not just an environmental perspective. Um, and I think that's important. I think that's pulling together a large amount of stakeholders to support these initiatives. Um, so it's not just one or the other, but, but both combined. And I was curious, how do you see uh, the work of your members fitting into the region's climate efforts? So it's significant. So the work of my members and the organizations that we represent, um, we like for them to do those projects, to have the solution, to have the technology that's helping to reduce energy uh, usage in our region or help drive up the amount of electric vehicles or electric vehicle charging stations um, in the region. So our members are um, very keen on what's happening around climate here in San Diego um, because they see their technology, their solution um, providing those helping those constituencies, whether they be cities or, or businesses, uh, reach their goals. Great. Uh, a question for you, Morgan. You work for an organization that promotes sustainability that has really community-wide benefits. Um, when you implement sustainability efforts, how do you weigh the benefits to the community? Okay. Am I on? <laughs> All right. Um, 
Well, for us at SDG e uh, similar to what Julianne was saying, um, we are a company that serves all of San Diego County and a small portion of South Orange County. So we have millions of customers that are stakeholders, and they they really demand more from us. They demand more than just having the lights on and having um, having gas that fires up their um, their stove every day they demand a clean energy company and they want you know they want their rates to be low but they also want clean energy coming to their homes and businesses so we work really hard to um, to evaluate how we how we weigh those things and how we can deliver clean reliable and safe energy. And as you heard um, Scott, when he, when he started off this morning, he, you know, the first thing he said was, you know, SDG is working to be the cleanest, safest, and most reliable energy company in America. And clean was the, you know, one of the first things out of his mouth. And so that really has been something that from, from the top down, our leadership has embraced as a driving um, core value of our company, and it's something that everyone um, everyone is able to get behind, from the folks in our call center to the linemen that are going out to uh, to put in new lines, to the folks that are coming out uh, in the next couple months to check your pilot light before you s fire up your furnace for the first time. It's really something that we can all embrace. So and so, it seems like you're. One of the goals of the organization is to kind of positively influence the community. So what, and if you're trying, and since this is about making that commitment and helping other organizations who are kind of on the threshold do that, um, what kind of programs do you have or what is it that you can do to actually help some of these organizations move forward? Sure. Um, so we have over 4,000 employees here in our region. So one thing that we really work hard to do is to connect our employees with organizations in the community that are environmentally focused or have perhaps a, um, an environmental program that they might be interested in. So we have a a green team at sdg and &E that consists of employees from all over the company. Some of their jobs might be a little bit more uh, environmentally focused than others. Other people just want to do something um, good for our region. So the green team puts together everything from an earth fair each year that brings out over 50 nonprofit organizations and organizations like the San Diego County Water Authority and the city's Think Blue program so that employees can connect with those resources and we're very purposeful that we put on this green team or this um, earth fair right in front of our cafe. So those employees that have to make their way to lunch, they, you know, they have to pass by these booths, they have to learn more, and um, they have to get involved. Uh, and then in addition to these offerings like our earth fair or our um, water wise day, we also have a number of programs that our employees are deeply involved in, whether it was the EcoChoice program that Scott mentioned, the 100% Renewable Energy program, or um, our battery storage facility that Jason mentioned, the largest uh, lithium ion battery storage facility in the world. We're working on all these really environmentally innovative projects, and so employees get to embrace that and feel passionate about that, and then outwardly, you know, they get to share with others and really have that commitment by saying, hey, I'm working on this project that's really cool, that's, you know, kick butt, that is driving our region's clean energy future, and, you know, let's embrace that. Thank you. Um, question for Jonathan is, as we move from like, kind of like this regional scale to this community perspective to the individual firm, um, I want to give us, you can kind of give us your feedback or give insight on how an individual at an organization, they can help push sustainability, kind of push the needle? Yeah, absolutely. Um, as an individual, <clears throat> excuse me, I think there's a few things that are within your control and a few things that are out of your control. And this is just going by experience with the companies we work with. And that, um, A, if sustainability is really core to your business, like, your, like a natural resources business, um, it's gonna be a lot easier to push through. And then B, if leadership is really bought in, um, selling it up the chain is going to be a whole lot easier. <clears throat> so I've seen that. I've seen it flip-flop where the leadership changes, then all of a sudden the sustainability program goes away, and then the new leadership comes in and it's important to that person, or maybe it's the shareholders, <clears throat> and then all of a sudden the program gets put back in place. But as an individual, and it, I could see from a show of hands that 
it appeared as though there weren't that many sustainability programs in place for the organizations you guys work at. Um, a few good stories, but I've one of a business here in town, and there was a guy we worked with, and he was an engineer, like kind of a typical engineer, and the business was um, pretty big, maybe like 200,000 um, or 200 million dollar business with probably like 500 employees. And he um, was super passionate about sustainability, and he added it on as like an additional part of the work that he was doing. So while his, he had his, his engineer duties by day, he did the sustainability stuff, we'll call it at night. Um, and he worked on that, say, for a year, for two years, and he really operationalized it. So he put a plan in place, operationalized it, and then lo and behold, slowly but surely, um, the leadership started seeing that there could be cost savings with the work that he, the plan that he put in place. So that was happening. At the same time, uh, we helped him put together like a report around all the sustainability efforts that he um, had put in place, and the re report was actually showing the impact that it was making. And the sales team took the report um, and they used it to sell through, they sell products, obviously, um, to kind of like a Home Depot size business in Europe. And it was like a deciding factor. So this, they got this big contract that's for um, X millions of dollars, but they actually won the work because of the sustainability efforts that the business had in place. So after all that happened, which was over the course of like, I don't know, six months or a year or so, um, lo and behold, he went from being an engineer to they actually carved out a position sustainability director, sustainability manager, um, but it was really shown like in the numbers. So I feel like uh, as an individual, think about the organization you're working at or working for and how core is sustainability, what's the leadership look like, and then um, if you're super passionate about it, you just kind of need to roll your sleeves up and get your hands dirty, and it, it'll pan out if you uh, can actually make some things happen. So just a little bit more, go into a little more detail on that. When you talk about if you have an individual who's in an organization and they want to kind of push forward so they get the organization to make the commitment because they've already done that. They're trying to balance those, the economic and the social and the environmental co-benefits of all this. Can you maybe talk once again about, and you've mentioned this a little bit about recognize what the organization, what their goals are, mm -hmm. um, but do you have any like specific strategy you provide for someone to, to approach their leadership if they don't have a sustainability plan? Well, I think it, it, it needs to always relate back to the business. So okay. you need to think about what's the actual, the, the business strategy and the potentially you would hopefully get like this two, five year business strategy from, from leadership. And then you would go back and tie the sustainability goals to what the actual business strategy was. And we see time and time again of these <clears throat> like bolt on sustainability programs where the CEO is passionate about panda bears and so they give you know all this money towards X, Y, Z, and it's got nothing to actually do with the business. So I think that what's really core, or what's key, and what's important is that when you're thinking about what to do, it needs to tie back into the business strategy that you can prove um, benefits, and I could ramble on about what all those benefits could be as opposed to just financial, um, as it relates to the business, and bring that as the, the business case to the leadership. Okay, that makes sense. A follow-up question for Jason is, you work with numerous companies within the region that their business model is actually supporting the sustainability efforts. But I'm curious, within those organizations, have you even seen some of those organizations change their own individual approach to sustainability? For sure. I mean, I think one of the, you know, I would say probably one of the biggest ones would be Qualcomm and some of the work that they're doing on site um, at, throughout their campuses. So obviously they provide a suite of wireless services um, and kind of at the core of that. but. You know, in looking at some of their sustainability plans um, and what they were doing on campus, I mean, I've really seen Qualcomm evolve over the years to where they have significant amounts of solar on their campus. They're doing some self-generation on their campuses. Uh, they, they have what they call the smart campus where they're utilizing technologies to help them manage uh, their overall energy consumption. Um, so while they're providing these technologies to outside parties, um, you know, they're, they're walking the talk, right, or walking the walk, whatever that saying is, um, so that they are doing things on campus um, while at the same time they're trying to sell those services and sell those technologies to outside parties. Sounds good. And for Morgan, kind of a similar question is, is with, at sdg &E, have you had some programs or some, or like some areas of the organization that have Basically, I, I don't want to say that it's more or less progressive, but ones that are more leaders and that other people have learned from them? Or is it a top-down mm -hmm. approach, or how did it start out? I mean, I think that for, there's always, you know, leadership, like we have a chief, um, chief environmental officer, and so he's often driving um, our sustainability goals forward, and we actually worked collaboratively with Jonathan to put together um, an environmental 
scorecard and some other things that are going to help us report more frequently internally on how we're doing in certain things. And for us, I mean, we have renewable energy um, that we're delivering. We have um, ch so electric vehicle charging stations. We have a lot of infrastructure that's very easy for us to measure, okay, we've installed X amount of charging stations, or we have this X amount of solar. But um, also, employees really resonate with learning from other employees and seeing what they're doing. So we've actually implemented really small things, like for um, wa our Water Wise Day, we had something called, um, it was uh, WWD, or What We Do, and it was, we went around to employees and said, hey, what are you doing to save water at home or at the office? And we really empowered them to tell their story. And so instead of just putting together some fact sheets or having a little booth with uh, information, um, we were able to get those employees to put together some photos. They went around their homes and took photos of, you know, maybe they took out their lawn and put in, um, put in water-wise uh, plants and, you know, little drainage culverts, or they put in um, all sorts of different things, uh, rain barrels. And so they got to stand there with all their photos, and employees could come around and learn from them. And they, you know, people resonated with it. People were like, oh, you know, Bob over there, he's a mechanic in, in our, one of our base locations, and he has nothing to do with sustainability in his normal day job. But at his house, he did all of this. And so being able to learn from each other and really empower our employees to tell their story internally, I think really helps, um, helps to make the difference and um, get everyone moving in the same direction. So I have a follow-up question. This is actually the last question, but it's something for Jonathan. Is A few years ago, we had Brendan Reed, who was with the city of Chula Vista as their sustainability manager, and now he's with the airport. And he talked about the importance of, like, going and having goals and trying to reach for those goals, but also having to kind of market those goals and communicate those goals both internally, because you do want to get the rewards and have people understand how important it is and also kind of get that uh, recognition for that. So I want to ask you, what's the best way to communicate those goals within the organization and also outside of the organization so that you kind of keep the momentum going? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. That's, this is really the business that um, we're in, in the communications business. Um, I think A, it goes back to the kind of the key priorities, of what's the key priorities of the business, um, and then identifying all the different stakeholders. And you mentioned employees, and that's a big one that often overlooked. Um, if you're talking with marketing folks, they're concerned with customers, but your employees can be your biggest brand ambassadors and unrelated to sustainability, that's just the case through and through. Um, so what's priority of the business? Who are all the different audiences? Um, you know, customers, communities, partners, um, investors, and then what's um, important what do they actually want to hear as it relates to your business? Um, and for us, to be specific about it, is we would develop messaging specific for our key priorities as it relates to each audience. Um, so how are we going to talk to each audience? And the tone and what we say um, should be tweaked accordingly. So we would develop the messaging for each audience, and then we would develop a communications plan. And the plan is what tactics do we need to do to communicate our message to engage with these different audiences on these key priorities? We'd make a plan for 12 months, for 18 months, and then every six months we'd go back and kind of reevaluate it. So it's, um, it's really determining like what's priority, what is priority, who is priority, and how would you communicate to each person uh, in each way. Great. So that wraps it up for the panel, but, this, but we are not done quite yet because we're going to do the second half of the exercise. So we can, and if you could just stay up here with me. If everyone take, pick up the card that you had, in, that I, you picked up in the beginning, and then turn it over. So the other side, there are two questions, and these are much more, less about the organization and much more about the individual. And um, the first one is really, it's looking at the co-benefits to sustainability. And so I, you can, what I'd like you to do is just circle those, um, describe the types of co-benefits you could get from a sustainability program. And so this may be a little bit more focused on the people who don't have one, but if you already have one, then you can circle those that you already have. So you can see your choices are you can save money to reduce costs, support your mission, process efficiencies, there's community engagement, employee engagement and retention, as Julianne mentioned earlier. You want to enhance a guest experience, and there's also facilities improvement, and there could be many others that you can fill in on the blank line. 
All right, and then there's the second exercise, and this, is, this comes from Jessica. This is the sustainability challenge. So if you think about yourself within your organization, think about you as the individual in terms of what you can do. You can make the statement of what, what, do I can, what can I personally commit to doing to help my organization's sustainability efforts. All right, so that's it for the panel. Thank you very much for coming out. I don't, Jessica, do you want to come back up here? She does want to come back up here. Um, so I'm going to invite Jessica back up here to close us out. So thank you once again. I want to thank our, our panelists for coming out. You can you give them a hand, please? Thank you. And for those of you who know me, if there's ever an opportunity to fill blank space with my voice, I will find a way to do it. So yes, I do want to come back up. Um, I just wanted to thank all of you again for being with us this morning and for another year. There's a few hands that have been here for all four years, so it's really spectacular. Warms our hearts to see, and it's because we're able to get so much momentum out of this group here. So thank you. Thank you to our honored guests who came, all of our speakers, our panelists. Uh, I think we have long lists of things that we took from both Julianne and the panel today. I also wanted to thank a few, um, two groups in particular, who helped beautify our room today. So if you haven't already, there's beautiful posters of artwork in the back, and those are um, courtesy of the Climate Science Alliance, and Amber's back here. She can talk a little bit more about that. And um, the Climate Science Alliance is a partnership of local scientists, managers, educators, artists and businesses, is there anything else that we can add to that list, Amber, um, that are working collaboratively to build resilience in our communities um, on climate change. And then on your tables, the beautiful plants that we have are um, borrowed from Good Earth Plants here in San Diego. They're gorgeous live center pieces that are helping to create a healthy start to our morning um, so we have healthier indoor environments. So thank you to those two groups. I hope you all enjoyed the networking and the discussion on stage, and I hope to connect with you over the next year year. Have a great morning and happy um, Halloween too since we're getting close to that. Thank you.